And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about time reporting and um, it's going to be one of our shorter presentations. So you'll get a little time back in your day. Um, and uh, as usual, um, to get started, we're recording our call. We want you to, we want to have a really um, good quality call. So we're going to ask you all to stay muted during the, the call. Um, but we do care about your, um, your comments and your questions. So please use the chat box in the lower right hand corner to, um, to pose your questions and we'll stop a couple of times to pose those questions and to answer them for you. Um, as I said, we are sending the recording and the PowerPoint out after each session um, as a follow up to each of these trainings. Um, so if you have other staff at your organization that you'd like to receive invitations to the rest of the trainings um, and to receive those uh, follow up emails um, directly, please use this email address cja.r3training at illinois.gov and we'll add you to the list. Um, and um, I'd like you to send us the staff member name, their role in the grant, as well as their email address. Whoops. So we just have um, a few items to talk about time reporting today. We're gonna talk about the pur purpose of this documentation. We'll look at the documents and then we'll talk about what we do when to, um, to review the materials and how you're going to submit them. Um, before I get started, though, I want to make one small announcement. We had originally planned to have tomorrow's session um, um, on the PPR, the Periodic Performance Report. Um, that, uh, that tool isn't quite ready yet, so we're going to make an adjustment to the schedule. And tomorrow, instead of the PPR, we are going to be talking about subcontracts. We'll take you through the whole uh, procurement and approval process for subcontracts. So, um, and we'll include that information in the, the follow up email today. Uh, we will still um, do a presentation on the PPR, but we're going to shoot, we're going to shift it to the last Thursday session, which I believe is November 7th. And since the grants um, can only, can't start until November 1st, you won't be too far behind getting that information on the PPR just that same week. So um, that's our, our news on the schedule. Um, so let's talk about the purpose of our time reporting. So um, if you tuned in for our session on cost allowability and documentation, um, one of the things that you heard was that, you know, all of the expenses that you're charging for the agreement need to have backup documentation. And so this time reporting information that we're going to review today will really serve as the backup documentation for the payroll and benefit costs that you are, um, that you're um, going to be incurring and that you're gonna be reporting on your PFRs. You're also gonna need the time records for the calculation of your staff time off. And you're also gonna need it for your own tax purposes, your, your staff members tax purposes when you issue their W-2s, as well as audits. So um, that's a real basic for any organization. You're gonna need time records for your staff for these purposes. But because your staff that are charged to the agreement um, are, you know, they're gonna be, you're gonna be reimbursed for those costs from a grant, you also have to um, document those, those, co those costs were incurred on the grant. And you're going to show us through these documents how much of that staff time were actually incurred for this grant program. So um, there's one level of backup that you need just as an agency, but then you'll also need the, this level of backup uh, because it's grant funded and you're going to be documenting how these costs are related to your grant. So let's talk a little bit about the documents. So all staff that are charged to the agreements um, must have, um, must maintain time sheets that document the time that they're working, but also the actual time that's spent on the grant program. 
So we're gonna talk about three different types of documents that you're gonna be, um, you're gonna be using. So you're gonna have basic staff timesheets. You're gonna have what we call personnel activity reports or PARs. And then there are 100% time certifications. Now the timesheets as an organization, I'm sure that you are already um, using some form of a timesheet um, for your staff to record their time, as I said, for just calculating their, you know, their time off and, you know, the time that they work. Um, you're going to save it for your tax purposes and for audit. Um, but uh, the timesheet should be, for our standards, should be a daily record of the time that's worked for all the staff that are charged to the agreement. So every staff member that's charged the agreement, no matter what their role, has to maintain a timesheet. Um, and that timesheet has to detail the time that they started work on each day, the time that they ended work on each day, and any time off in the middle for, for lunch hours. Um, you're also going to be uh, detailing any vacation, holiday, or other paid time off on that timesheet, any, any time that they've earned any time away from the program. So this should be like that daily record of the time that they worked. Timesheets also have to be signed by the staff member. They have to be approved by a supervisor. And you don't have to send these in every month with your, your PFR, but you do have to maintain them on file and they do have to be made available to the authority upon request. Um, and timesheets have to be maintained for all payroll and contractual employees um, that are working on the grant. And the way that you can define who is an employee is if they receive a W-2, if that's the tax form that re they receive. If, they're a 10, if they receive a 1099, then they're not considered employees by the IRS or by us. They're considered you know, a contractor, a vendor. And so you get to determine the, whether timesheets are necessary for them. But for our purposes, timesheets are required for any staff member who receives a W-2 and that staff member is charged to the agreement. So there have been some smaller agencies where a small share of the agency executive director is charged as a direct expense on the grant and the executive director will have to keep a timesheet as well. And if it makes you feel any better, um, all of these time records that we're talking about, timesheets and the PARs and the 100% certifications that we require our grantees to maintain, we have to do the same thing. So um, I'm a contractual employee, so I fill in a timesheet and send it to my supervisor um, every, two, uh, every two weeks um, for his review and approval. And um, I also keep track of the time that I spend on the program, on each of the programs that support my salary. So um, these are the, the standards that the federal government established in the, their financial guidelines and which the state has adopted through the, the GATA process. So all of our grantees do this, no matter what their role on the, on the program and the, our staff has to do it as well. So the second document, this is more grant specific, right? So this is what we call the personnel activity report. Now this is used by um, all the staff that are charged to the agreement who work on more than one program. Um, I maintain a PAR because my salary is supported by the R3 program and by a federal program that I assist with as well. So every day I keep track of the amount of time that I spend on R3 and that I spend on the SKIP program. So um, that's the same standard that we're gonna ask you to use for any of your staff that are charged to the agreement but who work on more than just this grant program. And I'll show you the, the template in just a few minutes. So it's an after the fact um, record of the actual time that I spend on the program. So while my salary is budgeted 50-50 for the two different programs, I actually keep track of the time I spend every single day on each program. Now um, that varies across the you know, the time of the year. 
I work a lot more on R3 at this time of the year when we're doing all of these trainings than I do on the SKIP program, which has um, takes more of my time in the spring when we have other um, other activities for that program. So this that's the same thing that your staff will be doing is keeping a record of the actual time that they work on the grant program every single day. Um, these forms that they're gonna be completing every single day will be submitted quarterly with your PFRs. Now for staff that are only funded by the grant program, they don't have to keep track on a daily basis. Instead, they're gonna be submitting a 100% time certification. So, um, and that is basically, they're saying, yes, during this last quarter, the only program that I worked on was this grant program. So that's a much simpler form to complete. And that too is submitted quarterly with, their P, with your PFRs. Now I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'm gonna bring up the templates that I referred to. If I can let me show this one. Can I ask a quick question, Maureen? Yes, sir. Can you clarify which um, staff should be filling this out? Is it everybody that's included on your personnel line in your budget or those that are on your contractor line as well? Both. Um, so as long as a staff member who that is charged the agreement receives a W-2 form, as opposed to a 1099 form um, for their taxes, those are the, the staff that have to keep the time records. Because if you receive a W-2, the IRS considers you an employee, whether that's a payroll or that's a contractual relationship. So everybody who gets a W-2 that's charged to your grant agreement should be completing the timesheet and either the personal activity report or the 100% time certification. Are there other questions? No more questions. Oh, um, will these forms be made available to us through the grant tours or where can we find these? Um, so a safe place, I just posted a link to where you can find them on the ICJ website. Yeah, and I, I'll send them both of these templates out with the um, with the follow up email this afternoon. Um, and actually, um, I think that we can also um, drop them into the the folders. But I'll I'll show you that in just a minute. But let's look at the form right now. So this is it's it couldn't be simpler. It's a really simple Excel um, spreadsheet. You'll see if it's for, we've set it up for a pay period A and B for each each month. We're paid twice a month. So that's the way um, we've set this up. Um, so you're just gonna be completing your agency name. This is where you enter the employee name. And then you're just going to be um, completing it for each month. Here's the pay period end date that you're gonna put in here. Um, like I said, we do the, the first to the 15th. Um, but you can modify this to work with whatever your payroll system, your, um, your pay dispersal system is. And they're just going to be, you know, like on, on mine, I write the R3 program here and the SKIP program here. And every single day I fill in how much of my time I spend on each program. So it's really pretty straightforward. Down here, you'll see that, um, we want the signature of the employee and the signature of a supervisor. And there's some little instructions down here. Um, I also want to point out um, that any leave time should that was taken should be noted on these squares. Here's uncompensated time. So if they've run out of leave and they're still, you know, they're taking two hours off that's uncompensated, that would go on this line. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward form. And I think when you receive it, you'll see um, how it works. So you can use whatever um, time sheet that your organization uses, as long as it meets those standards that we talked about, about you know the, it's, um, the time in, time out, time for lunch, uh, recording any you know, um, paid time off or unpaid time off, um, any vacation time on their time sheet. 
has the signature of the employee and the approval of the supervisor. And, you know, a lot of folks are using electronic systems, things like that. Those are, are fine as long as you can provide us those records when we, um, when we request them. Um, this is the template that you'll need if um, the W-2 employee, whether payroll or contractual, is split between the grant program and one or more other sources. So let's put that away. And I will share. Let me wait. I have to close that first. Sorry got about a couple that. Questions, Maureen. Yes, I'm got a couple questions here in the chat. Um, we have employees whose positions are funded through different grants, but right. only work on one program. How would they document their actual time spent on the PAR? So it's this is about like the funding source. So um, you would be listing all of those funding sources. I, I use the word program, but I suppose I, it would be more precise to say the the funding source. So your R three grant will be one line, and then the other funding sources will be the would be the other lines. Because what we're looking at is we want to be able to see the amount of time that that staff member is is working on the, the funded activity. So um, I, I like if you have a, a program that's working with you know, an advocacy program, for instance, for youth, you know, if they're spending 50% of their time on this funded activity, that's what you would record every day is the, you know, 50% of that, their daily time and 50% at the other funding source. Does that help? Do you have other questions, Aisha? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Um, if we have 100, if we have staff that are dedicated 100% to the project R3 is supporting, but is covered by more than one funding source, which certification should those staff complete? In the previous R3 round, I see Jen formed us 100%, but I wanted to double check if this is still the route we should go. Yeah, I would I would disagree with that because this is all about the, the funding source. So, um, you know, they're, if they're charged at 100%, if they're a full-time employee and you have them reflected in your budget at you know, half time, they were charged at 0.50 to the R3 grant, and the rest of their salary is, is taken up by another funding source. They should be reflecting, they should be using the, the personnel activity report because 100% of their staff time is not spent on the R, is not charged to R3. A little while is that, you know, um, we want to see that the the PFR what you're charging for Aisha's time, and their personal activity report conform to each other, right? So if when we come out and see your timesheet, or when you're audited, or you know when we we do a a site visit or a PFR review, um, we want to see the charge for Aisha. Um, you know, on your books, on your cost center, on your, you know, your expenditures. And then we're going to see that she's spent 50% of her time on this program, 50% of her time on another program. How does that compare to the budget? How does that compare to the personnel activity report? We should say that 50%, not 100%. So if you're, you know, Aisha is charged as 0 0.50 FTE on the grant, then we're going to want to see, and she's a full-time employee, we're going to want to see a personnel activity report as opposed to a 100% time certification because 100% of her time is not charged to this agreement. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought um, this was going to be the, the shortest, easiest training that we do, but... Yeah, um, and then if you don't mind repopulating the PAR real quick, Maureen, 
for okay. me. I know you got the certification up, but if we can repopulate the oh, PAR okay. and just kind of look at that again. Yes, um, real quick. Um, it is. So I asked Maureen to do that. So just in case you guys need for further clarification. So a 0.5 FTE um, will be considered not not necessarily a full time employee. That's a part time employee. So FTE stands for full time equivalent. Um, and if you have an employee that's only working part time for your organization, mm -hmm. they would not be considered a one as an FTE. So we count full time employees in that way. So say, for instance, you have two funding sources, you're receiving funds from ICJ from R3. And say, for instance, you're receiving also funds from ICJ for community based violence and intervention, which some people mm -hmm. may have two ICJ grants. So on your first line on line 12, you will put R3, I see your R3, and then on line 13, you will put CBVIP, right? And say, for instance, you have a part time person and um, they're spending 25% of their time working on R3 stuff and the other 25% of their time working on CBVIP. So, say, for instance, um they work um five hours a day right so for r3 you will put 2.5 hours in the r3 line and then you will put 2.5 hours in cbvip so that would indicate the five hours in that day that the person worked um with half of their time being devoted to r3 and the other half of their time being devoted to cbvip so for the person that had the question around, okay, I have the staff that is working, their funding is covered by another program, but they're working R3, you would have R3 on the top line and whatever that second program is that they're working at the bottom, and you would allocate their hours accordingly. Um, again, as, as Maureen mentioned, this form is focused on the funding source. So which pots of money you're paying your staff from, um, and you should be able to confirm that on your budget. So when you did your personnel line for your budget, you indicated whether or not the person was gonna be spending all of their time doing R3 stuff, or whether or not they were going, you were only charging 40% of their time or 10% of their time. So you would need to indicate where else that employee is spending their time on this form um, so that you are making sure that you are um, filling it out accordingly. Of course, the numbers at the top correspond with the days of the month. Um, so if the month started, you know, Monday was the second, for instance, you would start filling it out on the second and kind of move forward. That's if you have a Monday through Friday work schedule. Um, our next question that we have was, could you clarify if 1099 staff are required to complete timesheets or personnel activity reports? Not for um, our standards. So, um, 1099 employees are considered vendors. I mean, 1099 staff are considered vendors, not employees for by the IRS. So we don't require that you uh, complete timesheets and personal activity reports and parts because they're vendors, they should be invoicing you. So you'll probably want to know either on their invoice or on a timesheet, the time that they're spending on your program, um, but we don't require it. All right. Can we please get the link to the PAR? I don't see it on the list. Um, so Kimberly will send those um, out to everybody after this meeting, um, just in case you can find the documents on the website. Um, does a directly funded ED, so I'm assuming that's executive director, require a supervisor signature? Well, there should be some, like the, you know, someone on the board, for instance, 
um, who, did, who does your executive director report to? The, your board, right? And so, yeah, they do need to have a supervisor's, uh, you know, someone's signature approving the timesheet for that directly funded executive director. And I believe typically we suggest that it is the, you know, someone on your board of directors for your organization. Next question, is an equivalent to the PAR accepted? I don't believe that we are, um, Aisha, are we? No, I, you should. I um, think so, no. I've never seen an exception. Yeah, you should use the PAR form, the PAR form for um, any program funded by ICJA. Right. Um, is there a document that details the respective reporting schedule across the whole program? The 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 PFR and the um, PPR reporting schedule. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and actually in the PFR training that we did last week, we did review uh, the the reporting schedule. But also when you have your when your grant agreement is executed. You will receive a letter from emailed letter from your grant specialist that will um, detail the reporting schedule for both the uh, PFR, the periodic financial report, as well as the PPR. So the PPR is always submitted on a quarterly on the calendar quarter. So because we're going to start um, November 1st as the, the first allowable start date for these programs. You'll actually have five quarterly PAPR reports. November to December will be the first one. January to April, May till June, July through September, and then a fifth report will be for October. That'll all be set up. That'll all be documented in that letter. Um, most of our grantees submit their PFR on a monthly basis. So we do have some reimbursement grantees that elect to uh, submit their PFRs on a quarterly basis. So it's always the 15th after the 15th um, after the period that's being reported. So that first PPR is going to be due January 15th. Um, so it's always 15 days after the end of the period that's being reported, whether it's on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis. Great. All right, if you have a capacity building and service delivery grant at the same time, which certification would you use? And um, the answer to that is the same certification. Well, the same for PAR, Daryl, all of these forms are uniform across ICJ. Mm -hmm. So it is the, so you would, um, report each grant separately for 100% certification. So your capacity building separate from your service delivery. Is that correct, Maureen? Yeah, so you're right that uh, we use these same uh, templates, these same reporting structures for all of our grants, federal and state-based um, uh, grants. So, you know, in the example that Aisha has here that um, we have a staff member that is charged at 50% of their time to R3 and 50% of their time to CBVIP. They're going to be maintaining this document, but you're going to be submitting it separately to the R3 and, sep and also submitting the same document because it's the same information to, um, to the CBVIP program that supports that staff member salary. So they just have to keep the document once because that's the actual time that they've spent on these different programs, but they're going to be submitting it to both of those funded programs. Okay. Um, our employees enter their time work with their individual ADP login secure portal. Within their time sheets, within the portal, it indicates what program they are working. Do they also have to complete the PAR? Yes, that's, uh, um, that should be pretty simple because they can just get the printout from that um, from that portal and complete this form for us. So it's, it's not quite as sophisticated, um, but 
you know, the reason that we have one uniform report is that if you can, you know, um, what do we have? We say that we had 615 open grants this morning. Um, so that's not even counting ones that are in negotiation right now. So we have to have one template for all of the grants that are in all different levels of development and sophistication. So we have some grantees that are, you know, super high tech and everything's electronic and some that are pencil and paper. And so we have to have one reporting system that can work for that whole range of grantees. We can't have, you know, different systems for time or something as um, sort of a core function as time reporting for each of our different funding streams and the different range of, of grantees that we have over all the different programs. So yes, I'm sorry that they will have to fill out this little Excel file, but it should be pretty simple. They get a report from your, your fancy system and then fill this out. Okay. Um, if the CFO signature is accept, is the CFO signature acceptable on the CEO's par if there is no board of director in play? Oh, you have no board of directors. Um, if they can, if they are in a position to approve, you know, they have knowledge of, and they are, uh, they can approve the executive director's time, um, I think that would be acceptable. Um, if you would just, um, we'll grab the chat and we'll double check with legal to make sure of that, and we'll get back to you individually on that. Okay. Um, Uh, go ahead and move on, Maureen. I'll take these next questions shortly, just as soon as I can kind of read through them to get the Okey -doke. question out. But go All ahead. Right. Let's go back then to the much simpler 100% time certification. So this is the the quarterly document that will be submitted for all staff that are only supported by the authority grant. So as you can see, they're basically just certifying that they're they're keeping their time records as we've explained them, and that they're only um, they're only charged to the grant agree to the authority grant the R three agreement. There you go. So that's a pretty basic time report, and as um, we said earlier, we will also. Um, send this form out after the, with our follow-up. Then you can see what we're talking about. So let's, shall I move on to the submission and review or do you wanna get to those questions now, Aisha? Well, um, We'll just move on then. Sorry, I was speaking on mute. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> um, we have 50% for personnel on our three budget, but now we'll need to change that. Will that make a difference for the bottom line of the total award amount? We put 50% because they will be part-time workers. However, this is the only grant that they will be funding. Do you suggest that we change that percentage in the R3 budget? Well, for one thing, your award amount is not going to change. Your award amount, the total that you can, of funding that you can use from R3 is not going to change. Now, during the execution process is, as we um, review the budget that you submitted, um, your application budget, um, as we refine it and you know dig deeper, if you find that the time for some staff person is going to change, um, you're working that out now with your grant specialist as you execute the agreement. Um, but once you have a signed agreement that will be fixed, and if it changes throughout the course of the agreement, then you have it can only change if you get approved budget revision, right? So if you figure, if you applied for someone um, that's working, 50, you're gonna charge the staff member 50% time 
to this grant agreement, but as you work out cost allowability and things get changed and you realize you can only afford 40%, that's gonna be in your executed agreement. The, the, the size of your, of your award is not gonna change through this execution process. If you find that the actual time that they end up working on the grant is less than what's in that executed agreement, um, and you want to reallocate the dollars in the budget that you're not using because they're not spending 50% of their time, that only happens through a budget revision. So we'll talk about the budget revision in a couple of weeks, um, but for right now, you're working out as you execute your work with your specialist to execute that agreement. Um, that size of your ward is not gonna change, um, but you can, this is the time that you can reallocate um, within the general scope of what your original application was. You can, as we hone in on costs that are allowable and reasonable. Anything else, Aisha? Nope, that's it. Okie doke. So now we get to the submission and review process. So um, your PARS and your 100% time certification forms will be uploaded. We're gonna put them in that folder. You tuned in uh, last Thursday when we took you, we introduced you to the PFR, the Periodic Financial Report. Sarah um, told you that when you have an executed agreement, your grant specialist will establish um, a shared folder that you will use to submit your PFRs. So we can only commit, we can only create the PFR once we have a signed agreement, because by that point. We have a final fixed budget for your grant, and we have the dispersal method defined as well. So they need those two pieces of information to create the PFR. When they um, have that, they create that PFR, they'll send you an email, <coughs> pardon me, an email that will show you how to access that shared folder. And when you access it, you'll find the PFR tool that you will use to report your expenses for the over the period of performance of this grant. We'll also upload the PAR and the 100% time certification forms to that folder for you as well. So you have one location where you can get all the, these templates that you're gonna be needing. When you are reporting your PFR, you're gonna be uploading that completed PFR for the reporting period to that shared folder. And every quarter, you're also gonna be using that shared folder to upload your PARs and 100% time certifications. So um, it's the shared folder, which you can't access yet because you don't have a signed agreement yet. You'll, you'll see what the, that whole process is, is like and the PARs and 100% Time certifications will be uploaded to that folder the same way you upload your PFRs. Um, as I said earlier, the, the timesheets for your for the staff that are charged to the agreement, to the, the employees, the W-2 employees, um, we, you do need to maintain them on file. You do not need to submit them with every PFR or even on a quarterly basis with the time certification unless your grant specialist requires you to do so. Um, and typically we, we do not. Um, when we receive your PFR and your time certifications, basically we wanna see if they conform to each other, if they make sense together. Um, so if you have 100% um, charge, the person charged to the agreement, you've got their 100% time certification, those are the, the pieces that fit together. But we're gonna be looking at how you are charging that, um, your personnel and your fringe benefits. Does that make sense? The amount that's charged, does that make sense with that 100% um, employee? If someone, if you have uh, someone that's only charged 50%, we're gonna to wanna to see that, that that number makes sense with the, um, with the time records that you're submitting as well. I'll give you an example of one time that it didn't make sense. Um, so I was, I had a grant that was, it was a new um, R3, it was on an R3 grant. It was a new grant, but 
the program had previously been funded through another funding source, right? So um, their external funding ended September 30th and this grant started October 1st. And I got the, the time records and I see that there is time off that are that's charged in this initial period. Well, that doesn't make sense because they haven't they haven't worked on the program yet. How could they have time off? Well, it was time off that was earned under the previous funding source. And so, you know, that person, you know, worked and they, they earned their vacation time. But now they weren't working on this program, but we were charged for their salary on this program. But that that cost should have been charged to the other agreement um, because that's when they earned that time off. So it's those kinds of details that we look at where the time records and the PFR have to make sense together. So um, when do we ever review these time records? So we, the 100% uh, time records and the PARs, uh, we do um, look at them with the PFR to make sure they make sense together. Um, but your, your time sheets, um, may be re uh, requested if we do um, one of those um, PFR reviews where we, especially if you're a working capital advance grantee, early in your grant, we're going to ask for a sample of all of your financial records, right? So we're going to say, um, and let's send us the, you know, the, the backup documentation for all of your December expenses. And we're going to go through to make sure that there is that the that documentation for all of the expenses is sufficient to match that PFR. So we're going to be looking at timesheets and the the um, PARs or 100% certifications that you submitted. We're going to be looking at the invoices for supplies. We're going to be looking at you know um, the invoice for the equipment, things like that. Um, to make sure that you have sufficient back, backup documentation. And so time records would be, um, would be requested if we do a PFR review. Um, before we come out and do a site visit, uh, we like to take a sample of your backup documentation, not only for your expenses, but for your performance reporting as well. Um, because we'd like to have the opportunity to review that information before we come out so that the when we do a site visit we're spending time talking to you rather than just looking through paperwork so we may ask for a sample of your timesheets um, when we're coming when we're preparing to do a site visit and you know that if you are audited that timesheets will be important auditors will be looking at timesheets and comparing them to what the how the agreement has been charged for the staff time um, so that's all that I have to say about time recording. Um, do we have any questions in the chat, Aisha? Um, yes. So if you want to hire two part-time people to do a job that's on the budget, does that require a budget revision if nothing is changing other than the fact that two people will be doing the job instead of one? Yes, ma'am. Um, because it might actually have an effect on your fringe benefits for one thing, right? Um, typically, the full range of fringe benefits, insurance and things like that aren't, aren't typically provided to all um, part-time staff, so it may have an impact on your fringe benefits. But also, we need to know the, the names of the staff that are working on the program, because when they submit those time records, um, that needs to match up with the budget. Um, so, yes, you do need to do a budget revision to split that, that, that time between two people that was originally um, budgeted for just one. Great. Um, can we charge PTO and holiday hours as long as they were earned or accrued um, during the time that the employee was funded by the grant? Yes, absolutely. Yes, as long as it's a part of your written policy for your yep. organization um, as a human resource policy. Yes, you can. Um, to clarify the point about PTO, we should be charging ICEJA for the accrued PTO staff, even if it's not used until after the grant period. 
Um, well, yes, um, that should be charged. Now, these these grants are are designed to work for or to be funded for thirty six months. Um, it would be an, sort of an exceptional circumstance that you're going to have a big payout at the end for that time, but that would be part of your closeout process. Um, yeah, so if the grant is ending in 36 months and you have to um, pay out for uh, time off for the staff that have accrued it at the end of this grant, um, that should be included as a, an expense on your closeout, right? Um, but that's 36 months away now, and most folks don't have that kind of um, accrual with their, um, you know, like when I retired from the authority, I had accrued time and we had, I was um, charged to a couple of different federal awards. That payout of my accrued time the check that I got for the unused um, vacation time um, was actually charged to those two federal awards because that's where I, I accrued, I earned that time. But that's only when you're paying it out after the fact. It would be in your closeout. Okay. Perfect. If there aren't any more questions. Phew. Okay. So. Uh, as I said, tomorrow we're going to be talking about subcontracts instead of the PPR. And then next Wednesday, we're going to talk about sub awards. So tomorrow we're going to talk about the difference between a subcontract and a sub award, and we'll take you through the whole subcontract process. And if you have a sub award, um, then we'll go through that whole process next Wednesday, October 23rd. Um, I don't have the um, the survey link for you yet because I was a little tardy putting this together because of all of the change in schedule. Um, but we will send the link to the, the grantee survey uh, in the um, follow up email that you'll receive hopefully this afternoon. Any last questions, Aisha? I think I see some coming in. Someone asked, can you clarify again the difference between the PER and timesheets? If you can provide the timesheet template. Um, I think we can provide like a template. Um, it's not like the requirements uh, because again, we have this wide range of, of grantees with all sorts of different systems. So we're not going to require one timesheet format um, as long as the timesheet, which is the actual time that that staff member is working, um, total, all of their work, um, like I turn in a timesheet for the time that I work every day and it has my in and out time, my start and end time, the time that I take off for lunch and I sign it and I send it to my supervisor who reviews it and approves it and it goes over to our payroll so I get my check. Um, in addition to that, because my funding for my salary comes from two different sources, I have to break down that time that I spent every day between the work that I did on R3 and the work that I do on the federal program. So the timesheet, every staff member at your organization should be completing the timesheet because as I said, that's the backup for the expense that you're incurring for their salary and any benefits that they're paid, right? So when you get audited, if you have you know, the payroll register that, you know, shows all of your staff um, salary expenses and fringe benefit expenses, there should be a timesheet that an auditor can match up to that expense. That's basic for any organization. The PAR and the 100% time certifications are specific to our grants. So you're saying of the seven and a half hours that I work today that's reflected on my timesheet, I spent four hours on R3 and three and a half hours on, on the federal program that I work. So that helps to allocate within the seven and a half hours that I worked with what funding source do those hours come out of. So the PAR and the 100% time certification are specific to authority grants. Anything else, Aisha? 
Um, that's it. That's it. Okay, very good. So, um, if you have any additional questions after you receive the the follow up email today with the templates, um, feel free to use that um, cja.r3 at illinois.gov email address, and we'll we'll respond with those specific questions. Um, and I think that's all we have to say. So, except thank you very much for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow when we talk about subcontracts.